I'm MC Garofalo interviewing Joel Iskowitz, our first design uh, podcast behind the scenes for Icons of Inspiration featuring our Einstein portrait. So Joel, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. I appreciate being here. Nice to see you, MC. <laughs> you as well. So, Joel, I'd love to hear more about uh, Einstein and, of course, what your inspiration was for choosing uh, Einstein as a, a uh, individual uh, to showcase next in the Icons of Inspiration series. I, I guess my, my first response to that um, would be to use a colloquial expression uh, choosing Einstein was uh, a no-brainer. Um, many puns intended there, uh, <laughs> because Einstein, of course, is you know probably the most uh, famous uh, uh, incarnation of most people's images of a genius, of a divine genius. And actually, the more um, I, I uh, read about Einstein, and especially reading his own words and, and a lot of his quotes, uh, some of which were incredibly, uh, incredibly mystic and very humorous sometimes, um, I got more deeply impressed by the, um, the divinity of his genius, by the inspirational aspect of it. And there we go, we have our series, Icons of Inspiration. Uh, so he was really um, kind of the supreme choice uh, in, in our modern world, especially. And uh, I'm old enough to have been alive uh, during his lifetime. Uh, and so we have wonderful photographs and, and wonderful references that bring him uh, very much to life as a character, as a, as, a, as a human being, which is one of the things I really wanted to emphasize in the portrait on the obverse. So Joel, your portraiture is absolutely amazing. So can you tell us a little bit about your process and kind of how you get started? Um, you know, we can reference Einstein or in general, uh, but would love to hear more about how you kind of get started. Sure, it's, um, it's um, pretty much the same set of protocols in the beginning um, before lifting up a pencil, I, uh, I realized I have to do a deep dive into the research and really see if I could get to be familiar um, you know, with the subject, especially when it's a personality and I'm going to be portraying a likeness. Um, and in the case of Albert Einstein, because he was so famous and because he was so uh, you know, wonderfully photographed, um, there and he was so famous that he could almost be um, turned into a, a caricature of himself visually. I really try to focus on reading about uh, both his work and his life um, and his thoughts to help inform the portrait. So I had a better sense of him. And as I said before, the more I read MC, the more I got a deeper understanding of what a complex and very human character he was. And, and, um, and what I wanted to show in my portrait was uh, kind of a combination of his, his wisdom and his, his very human quality. His face exuded uh, uh, a very um, empathetic and human uh, aspect. So I really looked at loads of photographs, which is what I always do. And I wind up technically what I do is I, I make a composite, um, which is a composite likeness based on, I don't know, hundreds of photographs I must have looked at. And um, again, try to marry that with my perception of the character of the individual. So Joel, you know, I have the coin right here and I'm kind of just taking a look at it. You know, the eyes on Einstein are kind of my favorite because um, it just really brings out the emotional perspective of him as a human. What is kind of your favorite part or feature of uh, the portrait of Einstein on this coin? 
It's another another easy question. <laughs> thanks, thanks, MC, because with any portrait, you know, it's a cliche, but like most cliches, uh, they're often said over and over again because they, they ring true. The cliche being the eyes, being the window of the soul, especially so, um, well, it's true of everyone, but with Einstein having such a deep um, and penetrating and, and uh, you know, um, um, for lack of a better word, uh, you know, human universalist soul, um, I focused on his eyes. As a matter of fact, I thought that that would carry his likeness um, uh, and our understanding of him um, away from the cliches of the white mustache and the shock of, of uh, white hair, which are wonderful visually. I mean, there are some photographs of Einstein that, that are, are quite uh, astonishing. Uh, when you look at um, you know, his aspect, what he looked like. And as I said earlier on, he became kind of the cliche image of the, of the great genius. <laughs> Love it. Now, Joel, tell us a little bit about the the background that you chose uh, for the portrait of Einstein, because it's not the easiest and it's not the most, you know, recognizable, if you will. It definitely has detail and it definitely has a story behind it. So tell us a little bit about that. I appreciate that question because I thought long and hard about what would um, be indicative of, of his work and how I could possibly distill, you know, uh, things that are way beyond my understanding and pay scale uh, to, to comprehend like, you know, um, first and second theories of relativity. I actually did a deep dive into his technical uh, writing. Uh, and of course, uh, was very, very slow to pick up on anything but the, you know, the large concepts. But he had a wonderful way of, of simplifying uh, when he talked about his work, how they could be made understandable to a layman such as myself. So one of the main uh, contributions um, that he made, and there were many, to our understanding of the universe was relativity. And then I got very, very enamored with the idea of um, black holes. <laughs> <laughs> which um, are being, which are being uh, proven by things like the Hubble and now um, uh, the Webb Telescope. Uh, a lot of his theories are being proven um, uh, to be quite real in what we understand as the physical universe. So, for coin um, collectors and numismatists and uh, people interested in that, I thought the depiction of a black hole, as best I could would also be a very wonderful way of using the field um, as endless space and the graphics of a black hole uh, to, to really pinpoint um, you know, some of the very large mysteries he was talking about. And I thought it would, it would look good on a coin and, um, and be organic. It would, it would actually speak to his work. Absolutely. It also gives dimension, too, which I think is part of the coolest uh, feature of this particular coin. You know, it's, it really kind of brings out the 3D element with that black hole in the field of the of the coin and behind his portraiture. And I know you have a couple planets that you also highlighted in there as well. So those are also a neat detail uh, for the product. And Joel, you know, moving on to the the. Um, you know, the reverse, if you will. Let's talk about this muse that you designed and that's been utilized, you know, several times now as the reverse of our uh, Icons of Inspiration series. Well, um, that was a wonderful, a wonderful opportunity for me to create uh, a common, a common uh, obverse, reverse. It's, it's hard, it's hard for me to, uh, 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 to uh, not call her an obverse, although she's really the common reverse, the portraiture being the obverse of each in the series, in, in my thinking. Um, interestingly enough, Einstein uh, had always said in very simple English that everything is connected. Okay. 
And um, uh, she is a perfect um, invocation of that thought. Uh, if you look at her closely, uh, she's uh, reaching up to a series of stars that encircle the border, mm -hmm. but she's actually um, she's actually um, uh, taking a star and uh, and uh, offering it. Uh, it's a gesture to me that I interpret as um, we are all connected, and uh, Shakespeare said we're the stuff that stars are made of. Mm -hmm. So I named her Astra. <laughs> Uh, the goddess of, of the stars. Uh, and um, uh, she basically is symbolic of, of uh, the connection of all of uh, life as we know it. And uh, not only life on here on planet Earth, but, um, but the, uh, the celestial life that uh, is, still remains and probably always will remain a mystery. I love it. Her beautiful flowing hair and the intricacy of her, her face. And it's kind of got like a side profile, um, just beautifully done. And I absolutely love the uh, details on her dress. Um, you know, the flowing fabric, it just looks like it's in the wind actually blowing and moving. So it's I appreciate <laughs> that. And I, I, I just want to parenthetically insert in terms of design and artwork, um, how much I, uh, very, very intentionally tried to create a, a classic figure of great beauty. Uh, of course, you know, when I attempt such a thing, I look at the lineage and my, my antecedents like Weinman and, and uh, St. Gordon's um, putting a goddess on a coin. So I want to have that lineage fulfilled and continued but it's um, it's important to me that people realize that it's it's not classic in the sense that it's um, related to any particular school of art or any age in art history. To me, classic means um, timeless, that it could be appreciated uh, if it is beautiful. And I think she's beautiful. Oh, absolutely. Um, <laughs> could it be appreciated by people who are not particularly knowledgeable about numismatics or art or history for that matter, or from someone from a completely different culture. If it's classic, then it could be appreciated, I think, um, universally as beautiful and uh, does not exist in time. So Einstein was right, because he said that uh, time is an absolute illusion. So hopefully she's timeless. <laughs> she is. She's gorgeous. Like I said, <laughs> I definitely appreciate um, all of the, the craftsmanship as well. And I'd love to talk on that um, a little bit about the process and what that kind of looks like from your end, Joel, as far as getting started, you know, before we even get to this amazing final product, what's your process uh, to kind of get started uh, after research? You know, how do you how do you dive into the design work? And, you know, is that really the, the best part or what's kind of your favorite? You know, it's interesting. Uh, probably they're all favorite parts in their own way. Probably the most labor intensive is when I start, you know, ideating and researching. That's the step two immediately after step number one, which is tearing my hair out, wondering how I'm going to get it done. <laughs> But then there is the research and the question of uh, Astra on the back, our, our common reverse, our goddess of creativity and inspiration. Um, uh, I hire a model um, so that I could um, create a new version. I look at a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, art historical artifacts. And I do, again, um, a combination, uh, a blending, uh, a, trying to mate the modern and the contemporary with the classic. And so the basic process is taking photographs in the studio, drawing from the model, and then uh, really it's a process of assembling of uh, a kind of a montage, of kind of building up the reality. And I'll refer to our, our honoree, Albert Einstein, who uh, kind of famously said, you know, the logical process that we think we follow has very little to do with creativity. <laughs> creativity happens kind of by itself without us trying to. We don't know where it comes from. It just kind of hits us. It's not magic and you don't have to not work for it. You have to work very hard. But when 
it all coalesces. It coalesces, it seems, you know, um, by putting all the forces in play. And then after a while, very often, they gel and you, you get something that you're, you're proud of. Yeah. So Jill, how many hours would you say you spend as an example on, you know, the Einstein illustration? Because the, the level of detail and the decision making, what does that look like from your side? Is that something that, you know, is, is a long, long time or do you kind of get just inspirational spurts and you're like, okay, I got it. Like, how, what does that kind of look like from your side of the both of those are true, MC, <laughs> and 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 they're filled with pitfalls. When I get excited in the beginning, it all comes to me, and I I, I get a kind of a, a, a an image of what I want to do, and then the devil in the details, the complications of how do we achieve that, and then I have to go through that whole process of distilling all the research, and very often it takes a different a different uh, a different tack. I go down, you know, different uh, black holes, if you will, or rabbit holes. <laughs> and at the end, at the end, it, it it seems to come, it comes around, usually when I run out of time. And, and, and time, <laughs> um, to be more specific, each and every one is different. And they always take more time toward the end. Of course. Because that's when, when you're really uh, dealing and grappling with uh, the, you know, the refinements. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So Joel, you know, from, from kind of start to finish, do you utilize, what kind of uh, mediums do you usually draw these in? Is it chalk? Is it charcoal, pencil? What's kind of your favorite uh, tool to really get started? I am a very simple person when it comes to uh, a technique in that sense. I use uh, a number of different weight uh, pencils from hard to soft to get uh, a different quality in the line uh, to help describe to help describe the imagery so it's the simple answer to that is pencil pencil uh, for my designs for coins and then what i do is i'm an old etcher <laughs> uh, so i use my printing press uh, my printing press i use my printer as an etching press meaning I do my first drafts, I scan them in, and then I bring them into uh, software like Photoshop, and I rearrange and, and, and tinker with them, and then print them out again and, uh, that, and draw into it with pencil. That's my process. So I, for let's say the portrait of Einstein, there might be 10 or 11 different iterations of that drawing of just his face alone. Um, uh, which are very similar to the way an etcher would work on states uh, on a okay. plate. You take prints and make proofs and you see what you want to do and what you want to correct. And then you do that and you take more and more uh, proofs. So I do that 10 or 11 uh, rounds uh, for any given image. Oh my gosh. That's a lot of work that, you know, and then you get this final, beautiful, amazing product that just looks awesome. Um, how many revisions did you do on his hair? I have to ask because his hair is flowing. <laughs> oh, that's a that's a great question because on coinage, you know, you have to have uh, if things are going to be minted properly. Uh, even though uh, you know, I love Rembrandt and I love Leonardo, and as an artist, I love what the term um, uh, let's use strumato for soft, wonderful edges. Uh, but with coins, you have to have a clear edge to separate uh, each device on the field from uh, what's next to it or from the field itself. So Einstein's hair, <laughs> which is you know, uh, totally unbelievable and wonderful to draw and paint. And I've done paintings of Einstein. There's one down in NASA that I did um, uh, where I went crazy with his, with his white hair and actually blended it into the the cosmic matter of, uh, of the background. Can't quite do that on a coin. You have to be more specific. So mm -hmm. um, uh, I tried to get that, that shock, that beautiful shock of his white hair. And yet, if you look very closely on the coin, each edge is very clearly defined. Oh, absolutely. Yep. That way, striking process, correct me if I'm wrong, right? During absolutely. The production of people at Nine Fine Mint would would uh, 
come back at me and say, we can't do this if I, if I gave a, a soft edge. Yeah. Although we're getting better and better at, at uh, creating illusions for those kinds of transitions. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you kind of have his, uh, his hands nicely folded on top of one another. So it, it just kind of really looks, I mean, he looks relaxed and, and happy. And this is very, very similar to what we see, um, you know, across what Einstein is remembered as in a lot of his uh, portraitures, uh, uh, you know, in, in photographs and whatnot as well. So um, definitely the hair is my, kind of my favorite as well. <laughs> I really appreciate that so much, MC, that you mentioned the hands because uh, the hands are clasped in, in a kind of a thoughtful position. And again, the more I try to understand about his work, of course, the less I understood technically, but the more I got this, the, the, the sense of what a thoughtful man he was and what, a, again, what a human man he was filled with a sense of irony and, and, and real humor. So those hands are an important aspect in that portrait. Yeah. I think they speak a lot. He looks very composed, very, very uh, relaxed, and like I said, happy as well. So that's always a nice touch when it comes to coinage. So Joel, tell me a little bit about, you know, overall, how long have you been designing coins and how many coins have you designed throughout your, your career so far? You, you know, uh, in terms of numbers, I'm happy to say, MC, I've actually lost count. <laughs> That's always uh, a good thing. <laughs> I, I think it's a good thing. I, I stay out of trouble, um, you know, by keeping busy. I still manage to get in, in trouble here and there, but uh, keeping busy is important to me. I love, I love uh, the challenge. I love the connection uh, to, to the field. I love the connection to coinage and numismatics. I love the connection to art and history. So I really love what I do, and uh, I can't be stopped. And if I was, uh, uh, I, I can't be uh, seduced into stopping uh, by either, um, you know, um, uh, ha having uh, uh, more leisure. Uh, after a while, I, I want to get back to work, which uh, <laughs> just the way I'm built. So, Joel, how old were you when you started designing coins? Oh, uh, the very first coins I did. Uh, were way back in uh, the late 70s or 80s, and they were kind of a secondary um, uh, secondary offshoot of the fact that I was doing a lot of uh, stamp designs. Okay. And every once in a while at the uh, agency, they'd say, you know, we need some portraits of royals. And uh, you just have to do a, a little line drawing and uh, we'll get a coin made out of it. And I never thought much of it um, because, as I say, it was kind of a secondary thing. And then it turned out, ironically enough, that all my color work and illustration and my large paintings all um, kind of condensed into doing work for philatelic art. And then those back in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, those first coin designs, uh, that became you know, my niche, my career. Uh, a big part of that was um, was uh, when I was accepted in 2005 into the Artistic Infusion Program <laughs> of the United States Mint. And uh, I worked as a contractor with the Mint uh, for uh, until 2018. Okay. And that kept me quite busy making coins. And I was very lucky getting a lot of coins selected. And ever since 2018, I've even been more busy and actually more productive. <laughs> and oddly enough, you know, again, irony, well, uh, besides the icons of inspiration, I've been doing um, uh, some some work on the royals again. That is unbelievable. But it's funny how everything kind of comes around at some point, correct? <laughs> it really is all connected. You can't, you can't, you can't disconnect it. Uh, the disconnection is an illusion. It's literally <laughs> all connected. And if you live long enough, it all comes around. Yeah, Just sure. yesterday, yesterday I saw, talking about the mint work, I was very proud to have designed the uh, Congressional Gold Medal given to the uh, astronauts of Apollo 11 and to John Glenn. Uh, it was given to all four of them. Congratulations. And Buzz Aldrin, 
by the way. Yeah, you know, that was a very big deal. Now I just read just yesterday that Buzz Aldrin, um, uh, uh, his uh, permanent collection is, has been auctioned off by Sotheby's, that congressional gold medal uh, for an astounding sum. So I, I, I look at things like that and I go, my goodness, I, I, I did that too. So um, I'm hooked. I, I love what I do. Um, it comes out in your work, Joel. So we can certainly see that <laughs> by all means. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Joel, so random question, but I'll ask, how did you get started? You know, you're an art, you've been an artist probably your whole life. I'm, I'm not going to jump to conclusions, but I can tell by your, your artistic capabilities, you've been doing this for a very long time. So, you know, how did you get started uh, with portraiture and illustrations and drawing? Like, you know, have you been doing this since you were a young child? What, what does that kind of look like? It, it really is uh, something that started very early for me. Uh, when I was about five, uh, when you were about kindergarten age, I have to say that the combination of um, my parents and my teachers and, and positive reinforcement, uh, just getting a compliment, oh, what a beautiful drawing. As a five-year-old, you know, you want to do more of that. You get, you, you get addicted to the idea of getting, uh, you know, um, a compliment and, uh, you know, from you know, from the authorities in your life, um, uh, teachers and, and my parents. My mother especially uh, broke with the tradition of being the typical Jewish mother who would want her son to be a doctor or a lawyer and, and be run away with the circus. She actually paid money to have me study with a woman in our building that painted in oils, which I adored. Uh, so that was, you know, when I was seven or eight, I was uh, dying to be out on the street playing ball, but I also loved uh, doing uh, the artwork, uh, you know, um, that way. And one little story um, about portraiture, and it relates to Einstein and why I feel the eyes are uh, to be really, really focused on when you when you do a portrait. Um, when I was a boy, we used to go up to the uh, mountains, and sometimes we'd stay in a hotel. And in the hotels in those days, um, or at least in this one, there was a portrait artist, um, an Asian man who set up an easel and he would do pastel portraits of, of the guests, the way you'd see on, on the streets of New York or, or an art fair. And I was just overwhelmed by what I thought was absolutely, absolutely magic. So I would just stay there from the beginning to the end and watch him do his magic. And at the end of it, He'd take his little, his shaved white pastel and put in the, uh, the, um, the highlights in the eye and just bring it to life. So I was looking at um, basically magic, at somebody creating an illusion that was, uh, that was so, uh, so wonderful and magical. So I got hooked on portraiture and I still do eyes the way I learned as a <laughs> six or seven year old from that fellow doing portraits in the hotel. That's awesome. It's so hard to work with pastels too. I, I know coming from design school, you know, pastels is one of the hardest mediums to do portraits in. It really kind of draw anything out of, um, they're very messy and very time consuming and you have to be super patient. <laughs> That's true. So These days doing coin work with just pencils, I have much cleaner clothes. <laughs> You mean you're not getting the smudges everywhere? <laughs> well, I have I have my painting my painting pants and my painting shirt. There's there's no material left. It's so much old color. It looks it looks like a Jackson Pollock. I should send that to Sotheby's. You should. Those are <laughs> those are always the good ones, right? They keep for a very long time in the back of your closet, and sometimes use them. <laughs> So Joel, anything else you kind of want to share around you know your process, how you got where you're at? and or the Einstein coin that we're showcasing for next week? Well, to sum up, since I, I, uh, I must admit, I didn't go back uh, in preparation for our interview and, and, and uh, I didn't read Einstein's theories of relativity and try to you know, uh, <laughs> e extract some wisdom, but I'll, I'll leave you with a couple of quotes that I just love and I think really show um, 
uh, you know, what a, a, a deep, profound and lovely uh, human being uh, Albert Einstein was, what a perceptive one and perceptive about himself as well. One of my favorite quotes that I came across was um, when at some sort of symposium, I guess it was in Princeton, I don't know where, uh, someone asked a very astrophysical type of question uh, you know, of him um, uh, that involved probabilities and various calculations. And, and the question came across as basically, if a meteor were, had gotten off its path and uh, was swept into the orbital you know, field of the Earth and were on a collision course with the Earth, you know, what were the probabilities of such and such? And Einstein simply answered, well, if that happened, we wouldn't be able to listen to Mozart anymore. <laughs> uh, you know, quotes like that. And another quote of, of his that I thought was very, um, uh, very illuminating to, to his perception. He, he said, you know, uh, there are two things uh, that are infinite, the universe and human stupidity. And he said, but I'm not really sure about the universe. <laughs> There's some things you can count on, right? <laughs> and by stupidity, he, he was uh, compassionate enough to realize that we all mistake our rational minds uh, uh, for you know, the way to go about things. And he was a very big proponent of using um, instinct and going on, um, on feelings uh, uh, to, 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 really, um, to really make some... Um, uh, startling observations about life. So it's a great pleasure for me to have done that portrait. I'm so glad that the folks at Ampax, at, at Mix, I always say Ampax, <laughs> at Mix, uh, appreciate it and uh, hope that the, uh, um, uh, the numismatic community out there uh, and the public uh, also appreciate it. I can't wait to see it myself, MC. I'll make sure you get those images over to you today, Joel, for sure. Is it difficult to portray a face on such a small canvas. Can you elaborate a little bit and kind of tell us your thoughts on that? In a word, MC, very. <laughs> but to be honest with you, it's very difficult to portray a face in any media uh, and on any scale. But the challenges of, of um, distilling um, the complexity of a human face uh, and, and doing it accurately and, and um, hopefully beautifully on such a small canvas as a coin is, ex is, it is especially challenging. It's one that I relish though, because um, I, I really do feel that the more restrictive um, uh, the, the format, like a small coin, uh, it, it forces me to be um, um, my heightened editorial self and take a great deal of information and uh, see if I could distill what's you know, most telling, what's most important. So yes, it's very difficult to do, but it's a wonderful exercise. And the other part of that is I, my theory uh, is that the scale of any art is immaterial to um, the ability to tell a story uh, through design. I've done murals. Uh, I, I did some work for uh, the Air Force and NASA that was, uh, you know, large, uh, huge, you know, many feet wide and uh, high murals. And they have to be designed so that they could be turned into a postage stamp. They have to be designed so that they could be read simply and clearly, even though they're large. So the converse is true, too, with a coin. It's got to read clearly as a small entity. Um, and yet, um, if you do it right, you could look at it again and again and see more complexity. So, yeah, it's really difficult, but um, somebody's got to do it. <laughs> so that leads me, I'm going to add on to that. How big or how small do you work then when it comes to these particular pieces? So are you working on an eight and a half by 11 type of canvas, uh, eight by eight, and then scaling it down? Or do you kind of scale up your artwork? What does that look like? My drawing paper, when I take my pencil and I, I, I go over to my drawing board and draw, 
uh, for figures, I tend to use uh, uh, pages that are like for Astra on the common reverse. She's a nice uh, 18, 20 inch high piece of paper, good 11 inches wide. Okay. For smaller elements, which I do separately and then add them, I'll use uh, you know a legal or even a letter size, eight by 10 okay. page. Uh, and then um, you know I work for um, a basic circumference in the round of nine to 10 inches, eight to 10 inches. Uh, I want to see that um, clearly, and then I reduce it to see what it looks like when it's actually the, the, the diameter of the coin. Wow. So you work really big and then kind of go small is, is what you're saying. Yeah. Got it. Absolutely. Because you, you don't lose those details. We've, we've kind of taken a look at the illustration, your original, and then compared it to the coin, and it looks identical. So capturing all those features when you go from very large to very small uh, is pretty impressive. <laughs> That impressive part impresses me, the, the fact that you could take all the details. There are mints I've worked for uh, where uh, there were complaints that you know I was putting in too much detail, but in reality, the technology and the technicians have been catching up. And you see many more coins uh, with a, a better quality relief, much finer detail. And uh, so it's on you, the, the folks at Nine Fine Mint, it's on Emerson, uh, hats off to Emerson for making bar reliefs that in, interpret um, uh, my details pretty accurately, uh, quite accurately. And again, the production at the, at the Mint um, is, is where I'm taking my hat off to see that those details are not lost uh, under, under the strictures of all, all those concerns. Yeah, absolutely. All those, uh, there's yeah. there's a lot of manufacturing uh, constraints and things that you have to think about um, when not only designing, I'm sure, but also when we go into production to make sure that we hit those qualities and those standards um, when it comes to execution and lives up to our customer standards and, and really the industry standards uh, for collectibles and numismatics. So, and so exciting. far with the icons of inspiration, I've been so pleased with the uh, the minted results. So it really is a teamwork effort, mm -hmm. you know. I'm trying to design with the end, uh, with the end difficulties of minting, uh, you know, this under pressure, you know, uh, hot metal being, you know, <laughs> struck under pressure. I have to do my job and take that into consideration. And at the end, um, uh, Nine Fine Mint has been coming up with uh, unbelievable, um, unbelievably high quality coins. Uh, so uh, I think we're all pretty happy. Absolutely. Couldn't do it without all the different facets and cross-functional teams uh, that kind of go into making this a reality and really bringing the coin to fruition. So, well, thank you so much, Joel, for you know joining us today. Really appreciate it uh, and being our, our first uh, guest and uh, showcasing you know a little bit behind the scenes and what goes into the design work of these products. So thank you so much. <laughs> It's, it's really been a true pleasure, MC. Thanks so much for the opportunity. Absolutely. Just trust me, I hope uh, this is beautiful. So um, it came out fantastic. And I'll, I'll get those over to you today for sure. Um, but, uh, but yeah, Einstein just looks amazing. We're super excited for this next release. And, uh, you know, thank you so much again, Joel, for, for meeting with me and kind of going through some of the design backgrounds and some of your insights and whatnot uh, when it came to designing this product because definitely you know there's a lot that goes into this and a lot behind the scenes that some people might not even realize i appreciate the opportunity to let you uh to have me uh ramble on about it and uh i i, I hope it adds to someone's understanding of what goes uh, into it yeah absolutely absolutely <laughs>